Well, hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar from the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm Dave Chancellor, and I'll be your host. Uh, so today, we are going to be talking about the baby's first year's study uh, and the impact of cash support um, uh, for low-income families on children's early development. From the Baby's First Year's team, we're gonna be hearing from Sonia Troller-Renfrey and Greg Duncan, and then Brenda Jones-Harden will be our discussant today. Uh, we also have two of the uh, PIs in the project, Kimberly Noble and Lisa Genetian, who are gonna hang out and join us for Q&A later on. Uh, so uh, I wanna thank all of you, uh, but especially Sonia, Greg, and Brenda for being here. So, uh, so thanks so much to all of you. Um, I also want to thank the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning and Evaluation at the Department of Health and Human Services for their partial support of this webinar series. That said, any positions expressed in today's webinar aren't necessarily those of ASPE or the Institute for Research on Poverty. Uh, so we've got an hour today, and the presentation uh, is going to take us just a little bit beyond the halfway point today, and uh, then we're going to switch to Brenda for her comments, her discussion uh, on the study. And uh, we're gonna save the final 10 or 15 minutes or so at the end for your questions. So you'll see that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. So you can type questions in throughout the webinar and uh, we'll get to as many as you can before our time's up. We also have the chat box open today. So you're absolutely welcome to join in there. Um, our presenters might be sharing links and other resources that you can use. And uh, if you're having trouble at all, I'll try to help you out through chat too. So feel free to message the presenters if that's helpful. Um, uh, I also want to mention that we've got closed captioning uh, running today. So if that's useful for you, you can uh, turn that on and off on the bottom of your screen with the closed caption button. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, we are recording today's webinar. Um, and Sonia, I'm going to invite you to start sharing your slides just so we're kind of ready to go there. Uh, and we'll share a copy of that recording uh, along with slides from our presenters um, in the next couple of weeks here. So um, I uh, want to get started. And um, so let me introduce our first two presenters. So uh, Dr. Sonia Troller-Renfrey is a postdoctoral research associate at Teachers College at Columbia University. And uh, Dr. Greg Duncan is distinguished professor of education at the University of California, Irvine. Um, and I'm so grateful that the two of you are here. And I'm going to turn it over to you now. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're delighted to be here, Sonia and I. Uh, we're going to share our presentation duties. I'm going to start out, uh, and then Sonia is going to talk about the neuroscience, and then I'm going to return to talk a little bit about the policy implications at the end. Um, next slide, Sonia. Um, this presentation really addresses a lifelong uh, research question that I've tried to uh, pursue in various ways, uh, and it's all about implications uh, of poverty on child well-being. And the literature is filled with correlations. Uh, and what this project represents is uh, an attempt to uh, cut through the kind of ambiguity surrounding uh, correlational results uh, to try to get at the causal uh, impact of poverty, in this case, on infant brain development. Uh, the question is really, is income the active ingredient uh, in changes, differences we might observe uh, between kids who uh, are growing up in conditions with lower levels of poverty versus higher levels of poverty. Next slide, please. Um, the study we'll be talking about, many of you have heard about, Baby's First Years. Uh, it's the first randomized controlled trial um, of poverty reduction in early childhood. Uh, there are a number of others in developing countries. Uh, very few uh, in the US uh, and, and no other study that's really focused on early childhood in the way we have. Next slide. This is a uh, gigantic study. Uh, it's about $20 million altogether. Um, it's led by uh, Catherine Magnuson uh, here at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, but also Kim Noble, who's the lead neuroscience person um, you can see the, the list, uh, Lisa Janetian uh, is on the uh, webinar as well. Uh, Nathan Fox here at Yoshikawa. Uh, Sarah Halper Meekin, also here at Wisconsin, uh, is directing the qualitative study. Uh, and then Sonia is, uh, was lead author of the study that we're going to talk about. And uh, Wisconsin's own Molly Constanzo is, um, is a second author. Uh, the neuro neuroscientists are Kim and Nathan, and uh, they like to be last authors. And I always welcome collaborators who like to be listed last. 
Uh, we're supported by a lot of um, foundations, uh, but also NICHD. We have a big grant from NICHD, but you can see all the, uh, the sponsors uh, that have been uh, generous enough with their, uh, with their philanthropy to uh, launch and continue our study. But most of all, uh, we're most grateful to the communities uh, and the families who have participated in our study uh, for all of the cooperation that they've showed, all the kindness that they've shown. Uh, it's really, without their cooperation, we obviously wouldn't have anything to talk about. So we're very appreciative to that. The baby's first year's core research questions are very simple. Um, does a monthly unconditional cash gift uh, support children's healthy development and brain functioning? Uh, and then there's a mediational question, a pathway question. Uh, if it does produce improvements in kids' development, um, then why? What's the mechanism? So we also want to ask uh, questions about whether the unconditional cash gift uh, changes family functioning, what ways it changes family functioning in ways that might lead to um, better child outcomes. Um, we have this clinical trial. Uh, we've registered, pre-registered uh, hypotheses with clinicaltrials.gov and two other registries. Uh, the website for the study is babiesfirstyears.com. So you can go there for all of the um, a lot of information about the study, including all the instruments, the consent forms, everything. Uh, and we are also depositing our data on, uh, on the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research uh, website. Um, so um, we have deposited baseline data. We will soon be depositing age one data. So we would encourage people to, uh, to become secondary analysts of these data. Next slide, please. The, uh, Context uh, in which uh, our hypothesis emerge uh, comes first of all from the kind of structural racism and other kinds of constraints under investment in uh, poor communities that provide the context in which uh, our families live as well as uh, the processes that we try to study play out. So if you look to the literature, there are really two ideas about what the developmental theory of change is that might link uh, higher income, uh, poverty reduction to child outcomes. One is an economist story of uh, what money can buy, increasing investments, books, toys, things like that, um, that might uh, enrich a child's learning environment. Uh, and the second is more of a psychological pathway, uh, and that focuses on the stress reducing um, impact of poverty reduction, which in turn plays through parenting and other uh, kind of mechanisms that would uh, uh, cause changes for the better in terms of uh, children's behavioral outcomes and possibly cognitive outcomes as well. Next slide, please. Um, the design is very simple. We recruited a thousand mothers uh, in 12 uh, hospitals, the maternity wards in 12 hospitals. You can see the, uh, the cities here. We try to get diversity in terms of cost of living and uh, the kind of state uh, generosity of uh, benefits. Uh, we approach the mothers uh, shortly after they've given birth. Um, we went through consent if they were interested in participating in the study. Uh, we uh, provided uh, them with a debit card that contained one of two amounts that was determined by a coin flip. Uh, there's the high cash gift group um, that is getting $333 a month uh, loaded onto the card right at the hospital and then every month afterwards. Uh, and then the low cash gift group uh, with $20 a month loaded onto their uh, debit cards. Uh, our current plan is to continue payments for at least four and a half years. Uh, and we're trying to raise money to extend it all the way through uh, to six years. So covering the full period of early childhood. Next slide, please. This is the way the card looks, the debit card. It's branded for my baby. Um, it uh, provides uh, unconditional cash for the mothers, uh, not taxable. Uh, we work very hard to ensure that um, the, the payments on the card were not counted as countable income for the determination of benefits uh, from a variety of state uh, and federal programs. Um, 
and we have universal take up uh, of uh, of the benefits of the cash on the card. Uh, to date, only about 15 of the thousand mothers have not yet charged anything to those cards. And we know at least a few are using the card as, uh, as kind of savings accounts uh, with uh, plans to spend the money later. Next slide. Um, this gives you an idea of who the mothers are across these four sites. Um, we focused on uh, infants that were admitted to well baby nurseries. Um, so gestational age, 39 weeks, uh, birth weight is uh, 7.1 pounds. Uh, these are a, a combination of first births and subsequent births. Uh, mothers are about 27 years old, uh, a little bit less than 12 years of education. In terms of uh, racial ethnic diversity, we have about 40% of uh, the moms uh, identifying as black and non-Hispanic and about 40% Hispanic. Um, and you can see these other characteristics, 40% uh, with uh, biological fathers in the household. Average income is about $20,000, a little over $20,000. Uh, so the $4,000 uh, annual amount that $333 a month accumulates to represents a 18 to 20% uh, increase in uh, family income each year. Next slide, please. We uh, began, if you look at the top, in 2011, planning for this and fundraising for this, but we actually launched the study uh, in the middle of 2018. Uh, and our study did its recruiting over the course of a year from mid 2018 to 2019, uh, at which point the very first recruits, the kids were turning age one. So we started the age one data collection right away uh, that ran through uh, middle of 2020. Uh, and about two thirds of the way through, as everybody knows, uh, COVID hit. So we had uh, in-person data collection uh, starting in mid 2019 at age one, uh, but that only lasted about two thirds of the year. And it's that that in-person data collection that uh, we draw our EEG data from. Um, but we continued by phone uh, and uh, with age two data collection, which has been completed, that was all by phone. Age three, uh, we're most of the way through age three, uh, that's by phone. And then we have these big plans at age four to bring children uh, and mothers into the labs uh, to gather uh, more, um, EEG data, as well as a lot of behavioral measures of, uh, of cognitive and behavioral functioning. Next slide, please. We've been uh, collaborating with the Survey Research Center at the University of Michigan. Uh, they've done a wonderful job. Uh, the age one data collection, uh, both the in-person as well as the, um, the phone, uh, had interviews with 931 of the 1,000 moms, about a 95% response rate. Um, when you adjust the denominator, uh, age two, similarly uh, successful. If you click again, Sonia, that'll come up. Uh, 924 completed interviews uh, and age three were on track for another, uh, I hope at least 200 or 900 rather uh, interviews. Next slide. Okay, so now uh, what our age one uh, neuroscience study has found. Take it away, Sonia. Thank you, Greg. So just to start, I would like to just do a little bit of a background on why we think that a poverty reduction intervention might impact brain development. So as you may know, uh, brain development is most rapid during the first years of life. And this happens in really two major ways. So first, when we're born, we have uh, sorry, we tested this out and didn't have that problem. Hopefully that fixed it. Um, can you still see my screen okay? Great. Okay. So first, when we're born, we have a certain number of brain cells, but over the first few years of our life, we add many, many more millions and millions of brain cells. So that's one way our brain develops. Another way our brain develops is that the brain cells themselves become increasingly more able to communicate efficiently with one another by adding connections between brain cells. So here I show you what uh, the connections of brain cells look like at birth and how those increase rapidly and become much more complex over the first few years of life. 
Now, what's really interesting is evidence from both human studies and animal studies has shown that experience can shape how these processes take place. So we think that the outside experience of what a child is in may impact how the brain develops. And so when you start thinking about how do you look at how the brain is developing, particularly in really young children, one of the best ways to do this is using a technique that we call electroencephalography, or we use an electroencephalogram to measure brain and fit brain activity. So if you're not familiar with electroencephalography, we also call it EEG, which is a little bit easier to say. Uh, the process of recording EEG looks like this. So you put this cap on, to, on an infant's head and each cap is made up of a whole bunch of little tiny discs. And you can think of those discs at like microphones. So when you use a microphone, right, you make sound waves and that's recorded by the microphone. This, these microphones on the head, we call electrodes and they record brain waves. And what's really nice about EEG is by looking at um, the recording, we can get an idea of how the brain is functioning. EEG is also really lovely because we can put it on kids' heads while they're awake. They can still move around. They can still sort of sit on their mom's lap or function normally, but we can still get a look at how the brain is functioning. So when we measure EEG, each of these little discs or the electrodes gives us sort of a wiggly uh, line that looks something like this, which we call a waveform. Now, what we do with that waveform, um, when we think about looking at brain activity, is we actually break it down into what we call different frequency bands. So some of these frequency bands are slower. So if you look at this theta activity, you can see that it sort of goes up and down or oscillates more slowly. And some of these uh, frequency bands are faster. So here you can see at the very top, we have gamma, and you can see that it goes up and down quite rapidly. Now in neuroscience, each of these frequency bands has its own functional definition. We think that they reflect different um, parts of cognition, but it could be a little bit of a working memory exercise to keep all of these Greek lettered uh, frequency bands in your head and try to understand what they do. So for today, I'm gonna break these frequency bands down into two categories that map on really nicely to our, our hypotheses. And so those frequency bands, I'm going to call lower frequency power and higher frequency power. And why I liked breaking these bands down into sort of these two categories is that we know as children develop, they ha have a decrease in low frequency power and an increase in higher frequency power. Another way of saying this is that as kids get older, they have less slower brain activity and more faster brain activity, activity. So it's sort of like as we get older, our brain gets a little bit quicker in the way that it's thinking. So then how does poverty fit into this? What does poverty um, neuroscience research look like? So First, if you look just at birth, so here's a little tiny infant just days old in an EEG cap, we see that there are no socioeconomic disparities in infant brain function. Now this comes from correlational work, but basically what we see is that sort of no matter your family's income level, there's no correlation between what your brain activity looks like and your family's income. However, as kids get older, even as early as middle or late in the first year of life, we start seeing associations um, with uh, family income and infant brain activity. And specifically what we see is that kids who are from lower income backgrounds have more low frequency power and less high, higher frequency power. So more power in these uh, bands that are slower and less power in these bands that are faster. So if you think about what we just talked about, how, about how brain activity develops, right, you have low frequency power decrease and higher frequency power increase. And then what we see with poverty is that maybe that transition isn't happening as quick, or at least that's one hypothesis. So for our baby's first years project, we really wanted to look to see whether this poverty reduction intervention may change the pattern of brain activity we see. So first uh, thing we did is we had to figure out how to look at brain activity in all of these families we had recruited in each of the four cities that uh, Craig talked about. 
And this was actually a little bit of a tricky thing to pull off. Uh, getting a one-year-old to wear a sort of funny hat is no easy feat. And so to do this, we had to actually do a lot of piloting and a lot of working with families and getting feedback from families on how to actually get these caps to sort of sit on a child's head well, but also to deal with things like uh, dense hair types and some of the other difficulties of explaining what EEG is to families who may not have been expecting us to walk into the home with this sort of funny looking uh, technical cap. Uh, all of our piloting and all of our efforts to try to make this sort of culturally competent way of uh, explaining EEG to families really paid off with over 95% uh, of families in our study agreeing to try the EEG recording with their baby. What's really nice about that is that's pretty close to the uh, consent level we get in laboratory-based settings. Um, in about 84% of our in-person visits, we were also able to actually get the cap onto the head of the 12-month-old uh, baby, which is pretty good. It's also pretty close to what we get in laboratory-based settings. And we were finally able to get high quality or usable data from 435 children, which was 72% of our in-person sample. So just as a quick note, I say the in-person sample because of course, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we actually had to shut down um, in-person data collection partway through doing these brain measurements. So we have a smaller sample size than we originally anticipated. And I can talk uh, in the Q&A if we wanna talk a little bit about what that may mean. Um, but also we uh, documented all of these efforts in a separate publication, which is listed here. All right, so what did we predict? Well, when we thought about what we thought brain activity may look like and how the cash uh, gift may impact brain activity, we made some hypotheses. So here I'm going to show you a graph. And on the x-axis, I have what we call uh, e uh, hertz, which is how fast the brain activity is going. So where 2 hertz is really slow and 48 hertz is really fast. And on the y-axis, I have uh, hypothesized EEG power. So I'm gonna show you what we think the two groups might look like. Now this so far is just our hypotheses. And so what we expected is at the lower end of this continuum, we thought the high cash gift group or the low cash gift group would show more of this low frequency or slower brain activity, whereas the high cash gift group would show less. However, we also expected that this pattern would switch and that across the continuum when we got to the higher numbers, we would see the high cash gift group show, would show more fast-paced brain activity compared to the lower low cash gift group. So these were our hypotheses. What did we actually see when we looked at the data? Well, here's the actual data plotted for just for us to visualize what this effect looked like. And as you probably may be able to tell, we were largely uh, these this pattern is largely consistent with what we expected. So again, we see some hints maybe of the high cash gift group having less low frequency power and then more high frequency power when compared to the low cash gift group. Now this figure I'm showing you right now is just what uh, the data look like, but with no fans, no statistical tests. So let's take it sort of out of this visualization and think about what the statistics told us. So here I'm going to show you another graph. Here across the uh, x-axis, I have theta, which is our lower frequency power band, and then alpha, beta, and gamma, which are our mid to higher frequency bands. And on the y-axis, I have effect size. And then I placed this dotted line here around 0.2 because this is the effect size that we expected to uh, try to see, and also what we were powered to detect if we had had our full sample size. So when we looked at the pattern I showed you on the last side, statistically, here you can see we didn't see a significant difference in that lower uh, frequency band. So that wasn't as exactly as we predicted. But for the mid to higher frequency bands, we did see uh, either marginally significant, which is this little carrot, or statistically significant effects across the higher frequency bands. And so this was largely in line with the hypotheses that we pre-registered, which was really great. 
Now, when you're doing academic research, you may know that there's this idea of if you take multiple guesses at multiple things, you're more likely to be right. So, right, if you flip four coins and you say each one of them will be heads, you're much more likely to get that right than if you only flipped one coin. So the idea in science that when we do multiple tests like this is we want to correct for the fact that we make multiple guesses or multiple hypotheses. And so when we did that with our study, we checked sort of how, how will we adjust for multiple comparisons or just for different guesses, what our uh, effects looked like. So when we do one set of adjustments, what we, which we call Westfall Young adjustments, our uh, effects become less significant. So we have one band that reaches marginal significance, but the rest no longer are statistically significant. Another approach to correcting for multiple comparisons, and this is a, not really as common in neuroscience research, but is very common in economics research, is to actually create a composite. So when we created a composite across our measures, that uh, composite did cross statistical significance um, even at, after correcting for multiple comparisons. So with that, um, I want to show you these findings in one more way, which is that we also have hypotheses. What I just showed you was power across the entire brain. But we also think that what area of the brain these signals come from may matter. In particular, we think that maybe uh, areas of the brain that are more likely to be uh, supporting things like cognition or language or learning may be more likely to be impacted by poverty than, for example, maybe areas of the brain that are more responsible for things like vision. So we had sort of ideas of where on the head we may expect to see differences between these groups. And so for the two statistically significant bands, I'm going to show you what our regional effects look like. So to explain this to you, we're looking at a head from the top. So almost like a bird's eye view with this little uh, triangle be reflecting the nose. So it's almost like you're looking at a head from the top, looking straight down. And what I'm going to show you for these higher frequency bands uh, is the amount of power as it is distributed across the head. And warmer colors mean more activity and cooler colors mean less activity. So based on our hypotheses, we would expect that the high cash gift group would show more warmer colors than the low cash gift group. And indeed, for the beta band, you can see that here, where we see more warmer colors for the high cash gift group than the lower cash gift group. And when we look at uh, where this, this effect is significant, we have two areas, the frontal and the central regions, where we saw more of this high frequency brain activity. And this was statistically significant, even after uh, correcting for multiple comparisons. These are also regions of the brain that other research has shown have been, have been linked to things like learning and attention. So that was true for the beta band. When we look at the gamma band, we see a pretty similar pattern. Again, we see more warmer colors and we see significance in um, those frontal and central brain regions. Uh, one of these uh, regions, the frontal region, um, survives correction for multiple comparisons, the central region becomes marginally significant. So what does this all mean? Well, one of the natural things when you think about brain differences is to think about what does this mean for cognition? Um, and so one thing that I'll say is that in some correlational studies, more power in sort of these mid and higher frequency bands has been linked with higher language, cognitive, and socio-emotional scores. So if that pattern was true in our uh, study going forward, you might expect that the higher cash gift group, because they show more of this higher frequency pain power, may later on in life have higher language, cognitive, and socio-emotional scores. However, we have not measured uh, cognition like that explicitly yet. So we don't know the real answer as to whether or not these brain differences, what they mean for cognition. But that is something that we really are interested in is understanding both how the cash gift is changing brain activity, but also how the cash gift may uh, impact uh, 
cognitive and socio-emotional functioning. And so we're gearing up for an age four lab visit, which is going to hopefully start this summer, where we're going to be able to dig in and get a little bit more information and some answers to those questions. So with that, uh, I'd like to say, okay, so what do we know about how this poverty reduction intervention relates to brain activity? So what we call this is a weight of the evidence approach. How did we come to the conclusions that we have? Well, first, when we look at the whole brain, um, the effects that we saw were consistent in direction and in magnitude with what we had pre-registered. We had a smaller sample size, but largely that we, what we saw is in that smaller sample, we saw that the high cash gift group showed more power in these higher frequency bands or these faster bands. Now, some of these uh, uh, associations survive so multiple comparisons, some don't. So there's uh, this isn't 100% like everything worked perfectly, but we still think that these patterns may be meaningful. And that's particularly true because the differences that we saw were in regions of the brain that we thought may be the ones that we would see the effects in and also the ones that might support later thinking and learning. And these regional effects that we saw, so in the front, frontal and central regions of the brain uh, do survive the more stringent corrections for multiple comparisons. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things back over to Greg. Thank you, Sonia. It's been such uh, a pleasure to work with Sonia and Kim and Nathan Fox uh, on, on these analyses. I've learned a lot, as you can imagine. Uh, let me just close very briefly with a comment on uh, what we have found in a very preliminary way on mediational pathways, uh, as well as talk a little bit about policy implications. So mediational pathways, that evidence can be summarized in the next slide very easily. Um, in terms of the investment pathway, we do get uh, some preliminary support uh, that mothers in the high cash gift group appear to spend more time uh, and money with their children. So uh, time is things like um, reading books. We asked how, how often did that happen? Uh, playing with the kids and so forth. Money, um, we estimate that out of this, uh, if you look at the difference between $313 and $20, is, uh, $333 versus $20 is $313, about $60 to $70 of that uh, seems to be devoted to uh, these kind of enrichment activities uh, or enrichment expenditures that we um, asked about, uh, books, uh, toys, and things like that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the, the stress pathway um, is not uh, showing uh, the pattern of impacts that we thought it might. There's really no evidence um, so far, again, it's preliminary, um, that um, the high cash gift group shows reductions in stress or improvements in mental health. Next slide, please. So tentative conclusions, uh, we're cautious here for uh, the reasons that Sonia talked about, a poverty reduction intervention may cause changes in children's developing brains in a pattern associated with um, better cognition, language, and attrition, and attention, excuse me, uh, later on. Um, and this preliminary evidence that I mentioned at the very end uh, if anything, suggests more support for an investment kind of pathway than a stress pathway. Let me talk uh, about, oh yeah, go ahead, Sonia. Um, just a couple policy thoughts, and both uh, lead us to be cautious, I think, in drawing policy conclusions. Uh, if you think about, obviously, the comparison of the day is between our cash payments and the child tax credit extensions that are part of Build Back Better, um, if you step in the next part, Sonia. You know, in, in some ways, uh, things are very similar. Uh, our payment difference between the $4,000 and the $240 uh, is an amount, $3,700 uh, per year, that is very similar to the $3,600 uh, payment uh, that is is built in to build back better and was part of the American recovery plan. Uh, both are monthly payments. So that that's very similar. Uh, on the other hand, our payments are uh, one per family. So we don't 
provide extra money in the case of more children. Uh, the child tax credit extensions do uh, provide per child payments. So that's a big difference. Uh, and we also wonder to what extent a card, a debit card branded for my baby uh, causes mothers uh, and families to think differently about spending um, than uh, something that would come from the government as a child tax credit um, payment would. So those lead us to wonder whether perhaps some of the uh, impacts on child expenditures might have been partly due to uh, the nature of this For My Baby debit card that they got. We, we can't really test for that, but that's a caution. Um, secondly, go ahead. It's important um, to think, well, what do we have if we have these possible EEG differences? Um, we really would like uh, evidence on the effect of poverty reduction uh, on a set of uh, better studied indicators of child and eventually adolescent and adult well being. Um, so, if you step in the next part, Sonia, uh, Sonia talked about correlations between uh, high frequency power and in infancy and later thinking and learning, but they're, uh, they're uh, just correlations, they're not strong causal evidence. Uh, but we'll know a lot more when uh, kids turn four and come into our labs. So the final step in uh, is uh, one of caution. Uh, it's really too early to draw confident policy conclusions. Next one. Here are our emails. We're uh, delighted to be able to uh, answer questions that you might have, and we'll have some time in the discussion to do that. So let's turn it over to uh, Brenda now. Well, Greg and Sonia, thank you so much. That was, I think you covered a lot of ground in uh, not very much time, so we're, we're thankful for that. Um, Brenda, uh, I'm going to uh, invite you to start your slides right now, but as you do that, um, so uh, Dr. Brenda Jones, you're the Allison Richmond Professor for Children and Families at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, and uh, you direct the Prevention and Early Adversity Laboratory there, and you're also the president of Zero to Three organization. So um, thanks so much for being here. I think you're uh, just, uh, we're really looking forward to your discussion about what we've seen so far. Thank you so much. Let me just try to get this slide show started. Oh, uh oh. I think you've got to cancel that thing up there. Yeah. Uh, that box yeah, in the yeah, there we go. go. There you go. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so excited to be here. This is a very, very important study in my neck of the woods. Um, so I'm happy to be here to comment on it. But I'm also happy to be here because Greg and Sonia were presenting. Greg has been somebody whom I've read since my first year of graduate school. I probably read all of his papers all the way through. And Sonia is a graduate of our doctoral program. So I'm just really excited uh, that they and their colleagues have done this study. So I'm gonna not be as critical as some of the uh, literature, the media out there have been about this study. You can already tell that I think it's really a substantial, make the substantial contribution to our field and what it's done. And I think about this, this is a slide that I always present when I talk for zero to three, that we really think about the impact of early experiences on brain development and behavioral development. And this study certainly gives us another study to put in our repertoire of scientific evidence that suggests that what we believe that early experiences are so, so important in early childhood for the plasticity of the brain, but more importantly, for the behavioral outcomes of young children who experience adversity. So I'm thrilled to have this uh, again as another study in my repertoire. So I'm just gonna make a few comments. Um, first of all, this was a very, very well-designed study. Uh, it had the gold standard of designs in terms of causality by doing a randomized controlled trial. But the other beautiful thing about it that you haven't gotten a chance to see, but you'll see in the next few years is that it's a longitudinal design. So we'll be able to know how this early childhood intervention affects children over time, which is a critical question for us in the developmental field. It's also multi-method. And um, although the presenters didn't talk about this, they have beautiful qualitative data to support things like what mothers think about the card, what they think about their spending along with um, their um, quantitative methods. 
They also have brain and behavioral outcomes. So we get an opportunity to see how both of these work together. And as Sonia described at age four, they're gonna be looking at some of these behavioral outcomes. They've looked at mechanisms and Greg gave you a little bit about that. And, and this is the part that really excites me as a person who does primarily research in the field. They've got these cutting edge methods like taking EEG in the home, which I know is a challenge as Sonia described, but imagine how far that puts us forward in the field when we work with families who experience high adversity who aren't so likely to come into the lab. So I was very excited about that. Clearly, we've learned a lot from this study, but we need to learn a lot more. And Greg's sort of caution to us really suggests that there's a lot more we have to do, some of which this study will answer, some of which will be answered by other scholars in the field. But one of the things I just wanted to bring up really is that the data at least are looking like it's going in the right direction where an unconditional cash transfer does relate to brain activity, despite the fact that they had a truncated sample. So I think that's significant in and of itself because uh, when we worry about power problems and things like that, we got effects that look like they're going in the right direction. Um, so that's a good thing. I think Greg's sort of point about very preliminary suggestion about this investment pathway is really, really critical for us in this field. A lot of my work is around the impact of, of poverty on parental stress in, in a way, and I know we don't have all the data uh, just yet, but it really suggests that helping parents to move their boat up, to pull them out of poverty a little bit, does a lot more. I used to kid Greg and say he's going to put all of us interventionists out of business with this study, and I don't think it will. I was, it was a joke. But the idea is that if we can bring parents up to a certain level, maybe even they'll be much more likely to benefit from some of the interventions that we have. Clearly, there's a need to dig deep in these mechanisms to really try to understand from a quantitative and qualitative perspective why getting $300 a month would not only end up with, you know, maybe changes in what you spend on your children, but as Sonia was talking about today, in brain activity. We have to understand why, and certainly this study positions us to answer those kind of questions. We have to look at what happens later on. We have to think about the behavioral outcomes. And one thing I'm particularly interested in is the interactions. I remember Yuri Bronfenbrenner used to say it's all in the interactions. And I certainly like to think about those. What does this mean for subgroups, right? Uh, are the Latino groups going to look different down the line than the African-American groups? What does it mean for families in terms of service receipt? Are families who are receiving other services, do they look better in the long term? So I think these kind of interaction questions are important ones that get have to be answered, but I think can be answered uh, in the context of the design of this study. And the other thing that we learned, I really think is how important pivoting is in science. You know, science, we sort of think we got to plan our study, we got to do it exactly. And certainly those kinds of things help us to move forward. But I think this study is an excellent example of how the world happens, right? And so how do you pivot to make sure that science gets you at least a uh, part of what you hoped? And I think the fact that they were able to take some of these um, very high level technologies like the EEG in the home suggest a different kind of pivoting in science. And certainly with the onset of COVID, being able to pivot into virtual data collection was pretty miraculous. Okay, so I just want to say a few things uh, from a practice and policy perspective, and Greg sort of said to us very clearly, we have to be cautious, and I understand that, but I just want to share some reflections that I've had. First of all, this idea of unconditional cash transfer. I mean, a lot of times we do a lot of victim blaming, right? It's the mother's problem. She doesn't know how to raise her child. She doesn't parent her child. And here this study is suggesting, let's look at a structural factor, not so much about what the mother's processes are with her kid, but let's look at a structural factor like the fact that she has to raise her children in poverty. And let's see if we make a difference there. So I think that's to be commended. I also think, you know, Greg sort of talked about trying to figure out 
and they can't test it, obviously, but why is it that moms might be more willing to spend on their kids using the For My Baby card? Well, one of the things I started my career as a social worker, and one of the things that we talked all the time about was the stigma of government entitlements. And that not only comes from um, you know, the media, but also from in the parents' community themselves, you on state or you get food stamps or things like that. So whether, and I know we can't test this, but one thing that somebody else could test is whether taking away the stigma of a government entitlement makes this a little easier for parents to use. And then, I, you know, I've been a family engagement person for many, many years. And one of the things we talk a lot about is parent choice and parent empowerment. And I think different from a snap card, for example, where you have to go to the grocery store and there are all these signs about you can only use the snap card for this. This is saying you make the decision. So it's putting the power back in the hands of parents. And I think there is some data that suggests that that really does make a big difference in terms of interventions for parents. I do think one of the things, and this goes back to my point about interactions that we have to think about is the vestiges of intergenerational poverty and racism. It's not just about this particular group in this particular generation. And I draw your attention to some of the data we have on infant maternal mortality being at very, very high rates among middle SES African-Americans. So, you know, that some of the research that's coming out about those kinds of things suggests that it's all that uh, intergenerational experience of poverty and racism that leads to higher rates of maternal and infant mortality, even higher than what you see among you know, uh, uh, whites who are poor. So the question is, can this really address that? And I think this is a big issue for us to look at, particularly when we ask those kind of subgroup questions. Similarly, what works for whom? This is a big, big question in the intervention field. You know, we kind of know that one size cannot fit all. So one of my big questions that I hope this study will answer is whether there are groups for whom this works better than. And I hearken us back to some of the data from early childhood intervention studies that suggest that you get a better impact for families at middle risk. So I'm even wondering whether we're kind of pushing these families up out of poverty, maybe that puts them again in the middle risk category and might make them more susceptible to positive outcomes of some of our early childhood intervention efforts. And I'm gonna um, also just bring up a point. I was a student of Ed Ziegler's and in every presentation practically, I have him sitting on my shoulder. And one of the things he said about uh, pre-K, and this was way back in 1987, and I've used this quote a number of times, he said, we simply cannot inoculate children in one year against the ravages of lives of deprivation. I put the lives in there. He said, a life of deprivation. And I was happy to hear Greg say that this probably will go on for four and a half years but a big question for us is, is this singular effort going to be able to address all those kinds of things? So I'll just close with one of my favorite, favorite um, diagrams to show. And this really talks about what I think Sonia started us um, off with by thinking about the brain's susceptibility to change. And we know from all the neuroscience data, thanks to people like Sonia and Nathan and other folks who are on this project, that it's in the early years where you can see the best impacts of intervention on the brain. And I think although this study has a long way to go, it's given us preliminary data to suggest that this particular um, diagram, which is based on many, many studies, we have another piece of evidence that suggests that it is when children are very, very young that you want to pour as much as you can uh, to put them on a more positive developmental path. So with that, I will close and turn it back over to you, Dave. Uh, Brenda, thank you so much. Um, I, I think that just is a really good way to, there are a lot of things in there that I think are kind of going to kick us off towards Q&A here. And um, in addition to Greg and Sonia, I believe that we have uh, Lisa Janetian and Kimberly Noble from the project team on as well. And so as we start q and I uh, invite them to turn on their cameras if they wish to. Um, and so, you know, as a, as a kind of initial question, and we've got so many in the Q&A, but uh, one of the questions in there is just about the ways in which the project um, 
engaged community members, uh, parents and others in thinking about uh, the study design and some of the, the parts of the study. Uh, and I, I'd really like to give you an opportunity to speak to that. And Lisa, we haven't heard from you yet outside of the chat here. Uh, so if you are up for taking that one, I invite you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Dave. So um, it, was, it remains really important for us um, that this study, we maximize all the contributions of this study, right? And so one is um, in the area of neuroscience in the way that you just described and saw today. The other is social science. One is another one is certainly policy, but another really super important context is the communities and the families. Um, and so with that in mind, from the very beginning, we sought to create um, what we call community boards. And so these are stakeholders representing the families and organizations um, that, uh, you know, that are in the study, meaning um, the racial, economic, ethnic diversity um, of the folks in the, in the study and not, I only hesitated because I just wanted to be clear, they're not the academics, right? So these are folks from service organizations and such. Um, and we meet with them twice a year. Um, we had this goal of trying to do it in person and kind of having our entire advisory board in addition to our team visit each site to really spend time on the ground. That's been uh, disrupted a little bit by COVID. Um, so we stay very actively engaged with the community leaders. Um, the families, their voices are really brought through in the qualitative study um, that Brenda spoke about uh, very briefly. So that's being led by Sarah Halper Meekin um, and Catherine, uh, Catherine Magnuson, um, University of Wisconsin Madison. Um, and those are mothers from the two sites in New Orleans and Minnesota. Um, and so that is a very interactive uh, experience, right? Those insights come up to the larger team when we think about them. Um, and, you know, we try to make sure that we are sort of in sync in present in, in our findings and thinking about the findings. The last thing that we try to do um, and is hard is communicate back to participants. Um, and so we do have newsletters that go back to the participants. Okay. Thanks so much, Lisa. You know, we have a lot of questions in uh, both the chat and Q&A that are sort of asking about mechanisms. I mean, I, I, along a variety of just um, different avenues. And, uh, and Sonia, I, would you uh, take a shot at that? I mean, how do we think about just this connection between, um, you know, poverty's effect on uh, developing brains and all the things that might be causing that or leading uh, kind of connected with that? How do you think about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would answer that in a couple different ways. So first, you know, for this study, the biggest thing is that the only thing that we sort of changed and randomized across the families is cash. So the in some ways, that's really the cash gift is really the only causal statements that we can make in some ways. So I think that's one thing that's important to keep in mind. Um, but, you know, there are lots of different proposed mechanisms and, uh, and great data suggesting lots of things about the environment a child lives in and how it can impact the brain. And so Greg touched on some of these, right? So you could think of investments or stress, but there are lots of things even beyond that that can impact the developing brain. For example, I saw in the uh, questions things about, for example, environmental pollutants or toxicants. You know, by having a randomized control design, some of those things hopefully should be distributed across the two groups, right? So they should be controlled for in some ways. But the other pathways, you know, we have data that we're looking at and we're trying to sort of get get an understanding of maybe this is stress service is this investment pathway. But I think an important thing to think about too is that it might not be a one size fits all solution. For some families, it might be reducing stress. For other families, it might be the, you know, the ability to buy more things for your child. There are probably different fits and different ways that this money can work. And it doesn't have to be just one answer. So I think that we can learn more. I think that we can try to get some more correlational evidence for this. Of course, future research might try to think about targeting some of these mechanisms in a more causal framework. But I sort of think, you know, it's important to keep in mind that some of these things were hopefully come out in the wash from the randomized control design. And then from the other things that we're thinking about, you know, we can look for correlational or non-causal evidence in our data, but it's probably not just one answer. Okay. Thanks so much for that. Um, so Brenda, you have spent 
so much of your academic career looking at uh, a, just a variety of different interventions, a lot of what we might call like more hands-on interventions, you know, home visiting programs, um, early childhood education programs. And I mean, you, you kind of joked earlier that uh, that you told Greg that he was going to put you out of business, you know, with, with uh, the, the programs that you're looking towards. But how do you sort of weigh, uh, the, 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 I, I guess, the comparison between um, cash support for programs like we're seeing in babies' first years or the uh, sort of expanded child tax credit um, and some of the more hands-on ones. You know, sometimes those are pitted against each other in, in uh, policy frameworks, but I, I'm guessing you would not say that. Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think? No, I wouldn't say it, but I'd also start by saying we don't have much science on this. So I need to put that right out there from the beginning. We have a lot of science about one about interventions. We got a lot of science about interventions. We have less science about this particular type of intervention that's being described today. So I just want to make sure you understand that these are my perspectives. I have no data to support this. But I do want to start with the question I raised in my reflections about what works for whom. And I think in the prevention science world where we're looking at um, promoting kids positive outcomes as well as preventing negative outcomes that a big question is about what works for whom. And I would wonder if we uh, thought about families at different levels of risk, just like we think about in from a public health perspective, primary prevention, secondary prevention, tertiary prevention, that for those families who are at the highest risk, we want to put as much intensive kind of intervention as we can. And I think you have to think about poor families is really a very homogeneous group. I mean, Greg has talked about this in many of his papers, families cycle in and out of poverty. Some parents are in deep poverty. Some parents have chronic poverty. I mean, you have to look at timing and duration, but you also have to look at uh, what poverty means, like what are the correlates of being poor for certain groups and certain families who might be experiencing, you know, um, poverty that's that's not chronic might be able to benefit from this kind of cash increase easily and, and they just get help and they move on and they take care of everything. I think for some of the families that we deal with in the more intensive programs, there's a question about whether this is enough. It, it might be necessary, but insufficient, right? So that then you might want to add some of the more intensive programs, which, you know, if, if you listen to Jack Shankoff, he argues we haven't done enough on that side either, right? Because we don't have um, enough effects for those programs, but it may be that the ones that really do look like they address directly the stressors and things like that, in addition to something like this, might benefit families more. Okay. I know Greg and Lisa both wanted to add on to this too. So Greg, I'm going to invite you to, uh, to jump in here. Sure. Well, I never thought we'd put you out of business, Brenda, <laughs> <laughs> and I hope you stay in business for a long time. Uh, but, you know, I think... Um, the intervention world thinks about uh, these service interventions, right? Targeted toward the child, early childhood education, targeted toward the family, targeted for the health system. Um, and we're not suggesting that our um, cash-based kind of intervention would um, eliminate the need for those kind of uh, service streams, especially um, in the case of, you know, a substantial subset of, of low-income families. Um, but it's a kind of intervention that a lot of people who are involved in the service streams don't think about, right? So I think we really have to think about the whole set of options that are at, are at uh, our disposal. Um, you know, in terms of policy, they, now is the time for the cash intervention discussion, right? You know, later there'll be a time or in the past there'll be a time for the early childhood education uh, discussion. So we need to be armed with evidence about what works for whom, uh, including our intervention and including your interventions. Um, so Lisa, I'm going to invite you to go. Uh, we, we're close out of time. Do any of you have to leave right away? I, I think we can extend a few minutes uh, beyond the hour if that's okay. So I've seen head nods. So let's let's yep, go with that. So. Fine. Um, Lisa, let me let me invite you to uh, go here. Oh, thank you. So, uh, what I was going to say was along the lines of, I guess, Greg's comments. But you know, I wanted to also offer a reframing 
Um, well, one, a caveat and then a reframing. The caveat is, you know, there was never a vision on this team that cash is going to solve uh, poverty. And I just, I want to say that out loud and make sure it's crystal clear, <laughs> um, right? Cash is one of the many packages of support that we can think about to support families positively in a way that they can juggle the demands of raising a child in the very early years, the demands of the labor market, and the reality that there just is not a lot of other supports available in terms of um, earnings and paid leave and the uncertainties of the economy. And so cash can really be essential, right? Especially predictable, stable cash. Um, and then the second point I wanted to make is, you know, for me, it's very refreshing to think about cash as unconditional in the context of, um, I think, a persistent, um, unfortunate default that, that, you know, we think about interventions in a problem solving space and a real deficit kind of space. And if you think about cash and trusting families, right, to use the money in a way that can supplement, that can support, that can um, a, be a, address a diversity of needs, um, it's, it's a sort of a refreshing reframing that's very strength-based. And I think um, that's an important complement, right, to what's happening um, and the other important work in thinking about addressing other stressors and risks that families face. Um, you know, uh, we had a question in Q&A, and I think both Lisa and Kim responded to this a little bit, but um, from Dolores asking about whether sort of improving early child brain function should in itself be a policy goal, um, and, and how, you know, if it's, if it's premature to say that we've, you know, uh, we can reach policy conclusions from this, but, you know, what about um, sort of the nutrition benefit? What about some of the other things, uh, that the security things? So, Kim, I, we haven't heard from you yet, so I want to give you an opportunity to talk about that. Sure, happy to. Thank you, Dave. Um, a couple of things. So first of all, we would wholeheartedly agree that things like food insecurity, economic security are absolutely at the forefront of policy considerations, right? They also happen to be things that we're measuring in this study. And, you know, we've got uh, various other analyses and papers in various stages of the peer-reviewed pipeline. So do stay tuned for uh, lots of other impacts beyond just infant brain activity, as we discussed today. Um, to address the question about, you know, whether we care about, whether and why we care about brain function. Um, so let me just say a couple things. So first of all, um, we're actually very careful not to frame it as improved brain activity, right? We don't yet have cognitive or behavioral assessments on these children. They were just babies when uh, we were in the homes collecting their brain activity. We did have hypotheses that Sonia so beautifully laid out about the ways in which we thought that poverty reduction may affect brain activity. Uh, and those were largely drawn from correlational work suggesting that different patterns tend to subsequently be associated with the development of cognitive and behavioral skills. Um, but that's very different than saying that we've improved brains, right? You'll recall that these are all healthy, typically developing children, right? Uh, and we know that, um, you know, following what Brenda so beautifully laid out, brains are highly sensitive to their environment, especially early in childhood. So the typically developing brain appropriately and healthily adapts to the environment that it's in. So we, we certainly don't make any claims to improve brain development and we try whenever possible to sort of shift the framing uh, away from that kind of phrasing. Um, now, as to the crux of the question, you know, do we care about changes in brain or let's say subsequent cognitive or behavioral development? I think the answer is also yes, right? So not at, in uh, to the exclusion of caring about things like financial or economic security, of course not. But if it turns out that in subsequent years, we do see that this poverty reduction intervention has an impact on school readiness or down the road performance in school or graduation or even you know, employment as these kids grow up, then I, I think we can say that uh, there are, there's the potential for policy relevance looking at child development in addition to these other important family characteristics. So thank you for that. Um, you know, I, I want to respect everyone's time. And so, you know, Greg, what I, I want to let you kind of finish this up here today. You know, what is sort of our, our takeaway from this? What's sort of our wrap up thought and what do you want to leave us with? And I know uh, this study has a ways to go yet. And so what should we be looking towards? Yeah, that's a great question. It 
you know, I've been around for a long time. <laughs> and uh, the debates, the public policy debates over income support programs uh, focus on um, costs and benefits, right? And a lot of early debate and research uh, has and continuing uh, so has focused on the costs, on uh, our income supports gonna reduce work effort. Uh, is the money going to be spent on bad things, right? And what I think most of us have tried to do is to push the benefit side. Uh, we're really in this for improving the lives of kids uh, and promoting positive development. Uh, and it's been very frustrating in the political debate that that really hasn't received much attention. Uh, and one of the, I think, wonderful things about uh, the publication of this paper, uh, you know, can argue about statistical significance and things like that, but at least it's putting children front and center uh, in the discussion. And that has been a long time goal of mine. And, uh, and I think we're finally there, at least with respect to this paper. Okay. Well, Greg, Sonia, Kimberly, and um, Lisa, of course, had to leave. Uh, thank you so much for presenting this paper. Brenda, I'm so grateful for your discussion today and for you taking the time to, to join us and kind of help frame these issues. So um, yeah, uh, again, we, uh, we are recording this and we'll send out the recording copies of the slides very soon. And uh, I just want to thank everyone for joining us today.